Hello everyone. Thank you so much for attending this third session of our webinar series, Masters of Conversion, where you get to learn from the masterminds of winning website experiences. My name is Vipul and I lead co-marketing for BWO, a full funnel experience optimization platform. So before I introduce our master for tonight's session, I just wanted to thank all of you who have been attending VWO webinars in the past uh, for your consistent support and encouragement. We at VWO, uh, we strive to make your life easy by helping you understand the value of customer experience and how to make it better through an experience optimization program. Uh, I'm really glad to receive uh, the emails that you send me after the webinars, uh, uh, webinars like this that encourage me to do better. So thank you so much. Our master for tonight is the conversion optimization manager at Bitdefender, the most trusted cybersecurity technology provider in the world. Joining us all the way from Romania is Antonia Bogatu. Uh, it's great to have you here with us, Antonia. Thank you for having me. Perfect. Uh, it's, I'm excited about today's session. So before I, I pass on this mic to Antonia, I just wanted to inform just all of you that we have reserved 10 minutes at the end of the session for a question and answer section. So send in your questions whenever you have one, uh, and we'll be taking them up in the question, uh, and we'll be taking them up in the at the end of the session. So I think, yeah, with that, Antonia, the stage is all yours. Thank you, Vipul, for introducing me. Um, without much further ado, let's dig into how to get quality hypotheses for higher uplifts. Um, why am I talking about this? I've been working uh, in cybersecurity client side for three years now. And before that, I have uh, had agency experiences. However, prior to CRO, I have owned two businesses, one e-commerce and one lead gen. And um, it was during that time that I stumbled across uh, a CRO. And what I'm about to share, I really wish I knew uh, back then. Um, so everything in experience optimization is similar to launching a rocket. When sending a rocket to space, you have to minimize friction, first of all, and fuel it enough to get it to destination. Making this journey better means that friction can be turned to delight only if we discover what matters, what generates the friction, and how we can fuel the intent so that it goes further to the completion of our objective. Um, the way to find out more about friction and motivation is to ask lots of question and the right question at the same time. And we need to establish what are we solving for, for whom are we solving a problem, what do our users think they need, and if there's a difference between what they need and what they think they need, what criteria are they using to make a decision, and what happens when they don't choose our offering? What behaviors are conducive of our goal and their goal? And what behaviors are counterproductive? Also, we need to um, see how exactly the value that we provide matches what they are looking for. And for answering all of these questions, there are a lot of methods that we can use for research and that we use at Bitdefender. Um, anyone can benefit from heuristic reviews, can dig into web analytics data, can gather clickstream data, send surveys, have exit polls, do user testing, have form analysis in place, and watch user recordings. However, um, after you gather everything from those uh, research methods, um, you need to have a hypothesis. And this hypothesis um, has to be always uh, 
always, always focusing on prior research, has to um, suggest a treatment for a specific group of users that would encourage them to change their behavior. And the success criteria needs to be defined before the test happens in order to run fixed sample size experiments and to know what we evaluate at the end. At the Defender, uh, after we have the hypotheses, um, we use um, a uh, prioritization framework that's called PXL and that was developed by Conversion Excel. Um, why I like this uh, scoring uh, method is that it um, mitigates some of the inherent subjectivity by scoring higher the hypotheses based on multiple research methods. And of course, the higher that um, the score of a hypothesis, the sooner it will be tested. Um, this uh, hypothesis can gather more points if it is easily noticeable, if it's um, designed for a page with high traffic, if it will increase user motivation or and especially if it's addressing uh, an issue discovered by conducting uh, research, be it user testing or qualitative feedback or um, supported by heat maps, eye tracking, digital analytics. Of course, it weighs in on the difficulty to implement as well, because the higher uh, the the time needed to implement the less points it would have but uh, after summing up our process i'm going to show you exactly our research process for getting a fabulous uplift when we redesign the key page um our research plan was uh, to gather information from web analytics, clickstream data, user recordings, user testing, an exit poll on the page, and do a heuristic review. Now, as uh, Vipul said when he introduced me, Bitdefender is a leader in cybersecurity solutions with a huge history of innovation, having patented a lot of technologies that are now seen as standard. The page that we experimented on was the page that was meant to showcase our consumer solution. So um, we're going to go through the few sections that the page have in order to um, see how it was before, what we found from research. And after that, I'm going to go through what we did for an alternative. So the first screen um, in the page we've had uh, used to have a news header that displayed technologies, displayed an award, as well as seeing, um, giving the, the people the option to go for an offer or to compare some products. The second screen was focused on showing them a widget that was meant to help them choose a security solution for their particular need as well as at the small uh, at a glance a small navigation that would send them to all products um, another widget for choice downloads um, and um, the third screen was focused on establishing trust and uh, displaying recognition from media partners as well as the uh, independent labs that test our product. The fourth screen finally displayed the main solutions. Um, along with a very small description and the CTAs for buying. The fifth screen had some dedicated solutions. So our 
a small business offering and our solution, that's a hardware solution for smart home security. Last but not least, social proof. We needed to show people that others have used this and trust us. Now, for the research plan, we decided to head over to analytics, of course, and we begin by evaluating current performance on the page in order to first set a benchmark for the experiment and to plan the test, as well as figuring out what is the outcome of a user's engagement with the product filter. Um, the heuristic review um, would evaluate the product page for clarity, relevance, friction, distraction, and value. There are other frameworks, of course, but this is the most popular there is. The on-site exit poll, um, we wanted to find out if the page was fulfilling users' need to find information. We did that by asking the question if they were able to find the information, yes, no, followed by uh, a clarifying question that was uh, open in case they answered no to the prior question. Um, that was the strategy we use for maximizing the response rate to the second question. Otherwise, if you have like two open questions, then the response rate for the second will be lower. For clip maps and scroll maps, um, we wanted to determine how much of the content is visible for most users and what are they engaging with. And for user recordings, we wanted to see if there are some behaviors that turn out to be common and uh, which are the patterns. We've also decided to use um, two studies of user testing. So we recruited five users for desktop and five for mobile because their behavior seems to be very different even when giving them the same tasks for both uh, desktop and mobile. The study was um, focused on acquisition behavior. So what we asked is um, that people recall what they've seen on our homepage, then think about their needs for security and choose find a product uh, that would fulfill these needs and uh, then choose it, buy it, and so on. Um, what's more important about this process is to inquire about the friction that we had on the site and still maybe have. And um, we hit on this from multiple angles. So there was also in the task, um, but we also had follow-up questions about what um, they would want to change, what they would uh, want to have cleared before uh, buying, what almost stopped them from buying and so on. It's important to uh, identify what hindered conversion. So that's why we went uh, in from different angles for uh, for these questions. Now, after designing the research plan, it was uh, time to um, see our findings. From web analytics, we had that we found out that both we have a lot of room for improvement but also that interaction with this product filter did not translate into increased likelihood to purchase. Um, that um, added context for uh, our heuristic review, of course. So uh, back when we redesigned the solutions page, users uh, went to this page mainly after seeing the home page, and they used to have a few products and a little small button that would say more. 
that means that our users um, were expecting to see more solutions and they landing on this page that was displaying the award the technologies the offer and that meant little relevance above the fold it meant that we weren't fulfilling users expectation so there was really little relevance about the above the fold as well as friction generated by this mismatch between their expectation and the result still regarding the lack of relevance we only displayed solutions by the fourth screen accompanied by that the very small description and just a call to action with no reasons to buy thus not providing enough value for the product finder um, you could see that it added some friction to the page because we had no way to navigate back and forth between the options and the design also looked like uh, it wasn't really clear that uh, these are clickable and that they're clickable at the same time further on the exit poll turned out to uh, tell us that most people were not satisfying their need for information so more than half of them 65 percent almost two-thirds were not having their information need met when we asked uh, for clarification in case the answer was no we found out that some of them were looking for the free products existing users couldn't find the login and um, many people were looking for specific solutions that they couldn't find on that page looking at click maps on desktop at least we've noticed that some interaction was uh, going on on the product finder and correlated with the web analytics data so it got a lot of engagement but not a lot of conversions so it was clearly problematic for them there was some interaction on the cta above the fold as well and almost no clicks on the buy button cta so that's a very discreet shade of blue almost no one clicked there on mobile it was even more evident that the lack of relevance was manifesting so for mobile as you can see the most tapped um, area was the menu this is consistent with uh, little relevance as they were trying to get more solutions but they were seeing here an offer for uh, downloading a free app and of course they had little to no interaction elsewhere on the page from the scroll map at least on desktop it was very clear that uh, users were having an illusion of completeness also known as experiencing a false bottom so uh, when the background changes they were immediately dropping off and you can see here that um, immediately we went and spoke to a lot less people because they weren't scrolling so after the first one and a half screen we had less than uh, half of the users to scroll further and see the rest of the, the page for mobile there was a similar scrolling pattern to desktop this usually doesn't happen but here it manifested the same even though having the first section promote our free app meant that even less people um, scroll down and engage with the content from user recordings we've seen this pattern confirming lack of relevance uh, as well um, there was this pattern of people going back and forth to that page and eventually relying on the menu to find a security solution as they couldn't find 
them on uh, on that page. For mobile, uh, we've had something quite similar. So uh, as you can see, the, the user was trying to tap something and couldn't figure out uh, that the interaction was incomplete. So this added friction, made them abandon, and also the scrolling up and down meant that the page didn't provide the content that they were looking for. Now, from user testing, um, we've seen a lot of people reading um, through the first screen with no intention to click. We've seen that they were passing by the product finder mainly. And due to the previous version of the home page and the little relevance on page, it looked like they lacked choice. So they had the few products displayed on the home page. And uh, in this solutions page, they couldn't find any. So it looks like uh, they really had no choice except for the ones that we they've seen uh, in the home page or the three that were featured in the landing page, the offer. On mobile, um, the findings were consistent with what we've seen in uh, heat maps and in user recordings. Um, the mo most of them couldn't find the paid solution, so they were scrolling up and down, but they didn't find them. Those who found them could not possibly compare them as they were stacked and on mobile. It's impossible to evaluate something and to compare them if they are stacked. You have to have them one next to another. And for the one who the ones who found them and couldn't compare them, also seeing them stacked, they only had the picture, a small description and the price shown. And they lacked reason to buy, so in the end, most of them either abandoned or got the free uh, app. That was not what we were hoping for and looking for. The objective was, of course, uh, acquisition. Now, um, having... Uh, uh, all this wealth of knowledge acquired, we focused on generating uh, uplifts. We uh, thought of um, quickly establishing trust, first of all, in the first screen so that they would feel more confident and more compelled to choose a security solution from us. Um, we seen people struggle make to make a choice and to find products so another hypothesis was uh, uh, focusing on making product selection easier by showing them the solutions according to the platform that they have and we hypothesized that having an easier time to find products would uh, make the conversion rate go up we also thought um, of adding benefits uh, to the displayed products so that they would be more compelled to choose a product. So instead of just the description and the picture, they would have um, a small description, uh, some benefits, and uh, this way they would be more compelled to make a decision. We also thought of um, adding a link to the product page for each of the products in case there are uh, more thorough buyers that need a lot more information. They would have a way to see if the product matches their needs. And um, also in order to facilitate um, this um, choice between the products, we thought of uh, adding uh, and signaling the most popular options for each category of solutions for each platform. 
and uh, this way they would be more persuaded to choose it um, if they would see that their choice is popular with others as well. Um, there was also a hypothesis that um, if we displayed the products from the most complete to the most basic, they would be more inclined to opt for the best protection and to choose a, a more comprehensive product, thus making our RPV go up. We also needed to display services so that we would increase awareness from them, resulting in increased conversion rate for them. And we also thought of um, adding an in-page navigation that would be sticky and more available so that users would be able to use it whenever they are looking for or confused or trying to see a solution for a different operating system so that they have an easier time filtering choices and uh, so that um, they would uh, be able to make a decision easier. Now, um, for hypothesis prioritization, we used the PXL framework and we looked at our data in web analytics. And the conclusion was that it would take us more than one year to test all of those hypotheses. Then we made uh, the decision, the solution was to combine all hypotheses into one big challenger that was focused on making it easy to choose a product. And of course, adding trust. Um, speaking about trust, we began the challenger by establishing trust with a strong, unique value proposition that um, uh, cites also our number one reason to buy. So we know from surveys that people buy because we are ranked number one in a lot of um, independent tests that happen and were also reviewed by specialized media as well um, as number one. So people trust these third parties and when we cite them here, we help them make their decision. We also decided to bring the product filter above the fold uh, so that people have an easier time accessing it. Um, they wouldn't need to scroll. So above the fold, they would just select their device. And when they selected the device, the page would scroll to the dedicated solution for uh, the platform that they were using. So even less effort from their side. So reducing friction. Um, the next screen um, focused on establishing trust as well. Um, there are really a lot of uh, awards that our technologies win and we need to display them at every step uh, and also we link the sources because there are some users that are more thorough and they wish to read themselves. Um, where did that award come from? Where is that review? When we were reviewed as to be editor cho editor's choice and so on. And we've also added a small banner, but you have to observe that the small banner uh, that would link to the, the best offer doesn't have the background um, change for all of the screen. So it's a small rectangle, but it doesn't give the sensation that um, the page is ending there. And uh, that was done with the goal to alleviate, of course, the false bottom problem, the um, one that prevented users from scrolling. Oops. 
next, we displayed products and services um, from um, each platform. So for PCs, for example, we focused on displaying them from the most complete to the least complete. We included a few of the features that we knew people are using to evaluate. We um, showed the most popular choice in the category, and we've also provided them a link to the product page that would help the most thorough of them make a decision. Also, uh, the navigation that uh, you can see here with PC, Mac, Android, iOS, and multi-platform. This was sticky, so uh, along with the product choice widget that would help them, the trials and renewals, that would uh, serve uh, prospects and um, existing customers. These were all sticky so that they would be um, available for um, everyone, even on scroll, without needing to have uh, any additional effort from their side. Uh, at the end, uh, but not the least, of course, another trust area for those who might have, uh, might need more convincing. The trust area was showing how Bitdefender compares to other cybersecurity in terms of protection and performance. These are some averages from the last eight or nine years that were run by independent labs for both protection and performance. And over the years, Bitdefender has proved to be uh, a leader compared uh, to other uh, cybersecurity solutions. Now, let's talk results. I think this was what everyone was looking for. So, um, since our giant hypothesis was um, focused on uh, how to help people um, choose a product and have it have an easier time while doing this. Um, the product selector was the most used feature. So even uh, having it above the fold helped a lot. We had uh, most clicks on PC, then on Mac, and that's kind of the distribution in the market for solution as well. Um, now, it was concentrated here on the product filter. They used to scroll more. So not having the removing the false button increased uh, the engagement of users with the page. Because here, if you see in the control, there were less than three thirds of people, uh, reports, sorry. Um, going down, then less than 50% scrolled after seeing the filter, and less than 25% even saw our uh, products. And now the situation was uh, changed entirely. We've had 75% uh, of people see at least the PC solutions. Then 50% uh, were even seeing the Mac solution. And 25% uh, were reaching towards the bottom of the page, which displayed um, our services that weren't even visible uh, until then. So engagement increased a lot. We've seen in analytics more users choosing uh, a product from that page. We've also got a lot of uh, page views for a lot more page views from those who needed some more details to make a decision. And finally, of course, the uh, uplift in conversion rate of 85% and uh, uplift in RPV of 77%. 
Now, uh, of course, everything I've said seems nice and a big uplift is definitely uh, a very convincing argument to test further. So just because we um, had a great, um, a great result doesn't mean that we're done. Optimization is an ongoing process. So we took that result, we implemented as control, then we run another round of research. Um, we did analysis on them. We looked at how behavior is now and got another round of hypotheses that we prioritized. We tested, we've implemented the one that won and were successful and learn and iterated from the ones uh, that are not successful. And uh, of course, this process uh, is ongoing. Um, you have to repeat it. In a lot of businesses, you have a lot of opportunity when new products or services are uh, launched. So this is definitely um, a very dynamic. Uh, optimization is very dynamic. Now, enough uh, about me. I want to hear your thoughts, your questions about this. Uh, wow, Antonia, that was one incredible uh, presentation. I really loved each and every uh, slide and each and every uh, point that, it, that you had to share. Uh, I'm really happy that a, a company of a scale of Bitdefender actually understands the value of hypothesis and invests so much time in uh, collecting data to build a proper hypothesis and you know run experiments based on that so that's incredible effort um, and i really appreciate that yes that that's actually how it goes for us so most of the time is invested in properly researching um, mm. and after that we have the means to form a hypothesis Right, and I uh, just by looking at the presentation, I believe that you really enjoy uh, the work uh, of conversion optimization, and and uh, you know you really enjoy it. I believe, right? Is that true? Oh yes. Well, um, I figured out that um, there there was a gap between what we think that our customers need and what they actually need and exploring that every chance that I get is really, really very exciting. Right, I totally uh, relate to that. Uh, I, I can totally understand it as well. Perfect, so we've got a couple of questions for you, Antonia. Uh, I'll, I'll take them one by one, right? So get ready. The first question is coming from Vlad. So Vlad has a really interesting question about scalability. So he's asking, how do you go about the scalability of hypothesis? For example, uh, if a change increases a conversion rate in a specific country, would you then go ahead and test it globally to see if that scales up? Um, yes, that's usually what we have. Um, however, um, it can go well and we can implement across markets, but there's also tests where we have most of them behaving uh, in a way. We have some particular countries that don't behave in that way, or um, some of them that are isolated behaving um, in, in a certain way. So then what uh, we do um, is not implement for everyone because not everyone has to get the same treatment if it doesn't work for them, but only isolatively personalize the experiment, the experience for the ones that uh, work that way. Right, that makes sense. Hope that uh, answers your question as well, Vlad. So the next question is from Brian. Uh, Brian is saying, was time or available resources the deciding factor to go with the complete redesign? Can you go a bit more in depth on arriving at that decision? Um, well, um, well, it was both time and available resources as well as uh, the uh, prioritization. So we really went and scored 
every one of those hypotheses. And of course, they rank something like from six to 14, so the maximum number of points. And after evaluating them also according to our traffic data and our conversions, you really would have eight tests, each of them lasting a month, or in case that they did not, uh, so um, the, well, a month is the estimation, let's say for a medium or estimated uplift of 5%. But if we uh, went for a smaller increase in order to have a chance to reliably detect that effect, the test could have more than a month to run in order to gather the necessary sample size. So combining the fact that we um, had um, almost a year to find out something about just that user testing study and this round of research, with the fact that we were um, um, having um, to mitigate some of the effect of the homepage change. So that was uh, the, the whole context was that um, the homepage was about to change. And from all of those options that were sending people to this page and to the product pages, we were going to only have the one button sending them to this page. And considering that uh, there was clearly a gap between what we were offering and what people were expecting, and also the homepage redesign that was about to, to take place and be implemented, uh, considering both of these and all of the hypotheses, um, the decision we took was to have one that would have all of the hypotheses and uh, go and iterate from, from then. Right, right. So that makes sense. I think uh, prioritizing your uh, hypothesis is a key player uh, in terms of figuring out, hey, what how much time do you have and how much what test can you accommodate within that time yes can can we afford uh, to direct all traffic there uh, when we have this gap between what customers or prospective customers want from us and what we are offering do we afford to take one year to test all of this well in our case was uh, definitely not the answer right right totally understand that hope that also answers your uh, question, Brian. Uh, the next question is an interesting one. Uh, it's from Jenny. So Jenny is asking, how large is your CRO team? How many tests do you run a year? Um, well, the CRO team is not that large. Um, the infrastructure is uh, quite limited. The marketing team isn't that big. Um, I'm collaborating with research and design teams and implementation teams, as well as the with the stakeholders. So there are two acquisition and retention teams and we work together. This infrastructure um, also uh, takes care of the spreading of knowledge. So if I work directly to the people that are supposed to then learn from a test and implement those changes. We're also um, helping out to um, spread this knowledge from the test. And also um, it's the infrastructure for better knowledge uh, further on. So um, the team itself isn't that big, but working directly with the stakeholders and have them participating in tests um, helps us uh, have a lot of progress and quite be, uh, it sometimes helps having quite big changes because if we were just a small team and a little silo, um, we would have a harder time um, getting approval for these kinds of tests. But working together, then we can do even bigger changes. Hope this answers your question. Right, right. So, th so that actually makes me curious about uh, this one point. I remember in our previous session with Sigi from HSBC last uh, last week, he mentioned about a learning hub, 
and that was quite an intriguing idea do you do have a uh, sort of a learning hub of a kind wherein you know where wherein you feed the learnings from your experiments or you know whatever learning you have and share it with the entire team so they are all on the same page um so we have um a couple of ways that we do this um we have firstly something that resembles a newsletter but it's not really a newsletter where we announce um what experiments we have live what results we've had and uh, what uh, learnings we have for the future um that is one way and it's the more extended way that um, knowledge from this experimentation program gets uh, spread across the company and there are um smaller sessions that happen just with the acquisition or the retention team or the product marketing team um the and we gather specifically for a round of tests pros tests and um everyone shares their opinion um we see if there's something to adjust and after we run the experiment we meet again for an extended uh, analysis on the set test whether we have to learn or implement and learn for other experiments um or other pages that would go live without um without an experiment priorly but Very using sure. the, the learnings that we've had from the from the test and of course the third way but that's um less used uh, we archive full test data along with um, mockups and uh, results and hypotheses and research and we have a knowledge base but they don't it's not really that uh, accessible let's say that internally it's easier to process uh, an information with someone uh, along your side than to just go into some impersonal uh, uh, knowledge base about this right right that ma totally makes sense and i uh, really love that you do uh, pay attention to you know distributing the knowledge from a particular experiment among the entire team or mm -hmm. whoever just yeah, that's that that's great just vital because um, some sometimes and um, it's some knowledge that uh, turns out to still be valid for other situations and if you right. have learned it from the test priorly then you can just um, implement and, and be sure that it works exactly exactly and that is the primary purpose of having uh, a central repository of all the learnings so that you are you're not you know uh, sort of what you, what you call repeating what you've already done you know mm -hmm. you can mm -hmm. well from time to time things change and you can repeat some experiments just because you ah. it it worked some five years ago it doesn't mean that it wouldn't mm. work now but uh, for things that were quite recently tested yes we don't go and double that down we prefer to experiment with uh, things that would help us learn new things about our audience right exactly uh thank you for answering that so uh, we are a bit slightly out of time i'm sorry guys i'll just take two more questions here uh the second last question that i'm taking is uh, something which i am also curious to know more about and uh, this question is coming from hari manjunathan uh he's talking he's asking how do you recruit users uh, for user testing of your landing pages oh uh that's a really good question so um um there are two ways that we do this one is through um conventional uh user testing services and there we um, filter down their database um for the particular personas that uh, we know that we have so we need them to resemble what our typical buyers look like because if there wouldn't be someone for whom this content was relevant then the results would be unusable um that's the first method 
Um, however, for, for this method, I wouldn't recommend relying on income or education data really, because anyone can say they're kind of whatever, and um, it's uh, not like you have a background check for that. So you can recruit them in terms of demographics uh, and geo, but uh, other than that, um, for a very exact um, uh, the m matching of the persona, it doesn't work. The second way is uh, on our website. So we have a, a small prompt that uh, would uh, ask users if they want to help us. We have a small questionnaire where we focus on getting the relevant people and as well exclude marketers, designers, developers that would uh, that are more inclined to share their professional opinion rather than their uh, experience as a individual user. Um, and after we uh, gather all of these answers, we select the ones that match our criteria. Um, we conduct the user testing and we usually give them some reward like um, an Amazon coupon or vouchers for our products or um, something like this. Uh, I hope this answers the question. Right, right. Amazon, Amazon coupons work just everywhere. We, we, uh, even when we have done some dedicated uh, you know, user testing, uh, Amazon coupons have <laughs> Uh, proved to be uh, what you call the ma a major incentive in terms of bringing people in. <laughs> the it helps. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, there's there's also the variant when you have people over in the HQ, and uh, we sit in uh, the room and we observe what the moderator is uh, um, doing while testing with the user. But the process of recruitment is sort of the same. It's uh, quite similar, the rewards look like that even in that setting. So I um, right. really hope this answers okay. that. Uh, yep, I hope Hari, you uh, took notes from that answer. Uh, that was a really good answer there. Uh, thanks, Antonia. So the last question for tonight is uh, from Ilkim. Uh, I'm sorry, Ilkim, if I pronounced your name incorrectly, but Ilkim is asking, how do you calculate the significance of the test? Which method are you using? Oh, sorry, which? Which method, method are you using? I think they're referring to frequentist or Bayesian. Is that I? So uh, he's basically asking uh, for calculating the significance of the test. Uh, it's okay if you don't understand the answer. Maybe I'll, uh, you can. Uh, I'll share the uh, Ilkin's email with you. Uh, you can send over your reply to him directly. Yes, I, I think this is, uh, uh, I don't really understand it. It's a good question. I think it's referring to uh, the uh, age old debate between frequentist and Bayesian. Um, and I, do, having a background in finance myself and a lot of statistics, I, um, I'm fluid with both methods, and um, there are a lot of other things to consider, uh, not only statistical significance when deciding for a test. Now, for most tests that I've seen, um, we don't see many or significant differences between using frequentist stats or Bayesian. So if a hypothesis was really good, and we based it on research, the result will be significant even in a frequentist test, so a T or Z, one-tailed or two-tailed, uh, and in a patient setup as well. So I hope this answers the questions. I don't personally have a preference. Uh, frequentist or patient is kind of the same if the test hypothesis was good. Sure, not a problem, Antonia. So, uh, but, um, if uh, the if I misunderstood the question, I would uh, love to chat more with um, 
him to get the, the question right and to provide the answer. So, so there are a few more questions here, um, and I'm really sorry, guys, uh, due to the lack of time, I won't be able to take all of them. But sure, Antonio, I'll uh, send all these questions to you, right? And you can reach out to these people with the answers uh, post this webinar. So yeah, yes, uh, I sure will. Great. So yeah, that's it for today. Uh, thanks again, Antonia, for your wonderful session and incredible presentation uh, and taking out the time uh, for this session. I'm sure the audience must have loved it and uh, learned something new today. Well, thank you for inviting me. Uh, pleasure, pleasure. So yes, guys, so as you can see, uh, we have more, uh, many more interesting and insightful sessions like this one uh, scheduled in 2020. Uh, the details of them are available and will be made available on vw.com slash webcast. The link is right there in front of you. You can just take a snapshot, snapshot if you want to, uh, but do check out the page for all the updates and, on, and all the upcoming sessions that we have lined up. Uh, they're going to be great. <laughs> the link is also available in the chat window. So if you just want to click it right now and go there, that's fine as well. Uh, great, great. Thanks again. Thanks everyone for joining the session. Have a great day and have a very, very happy new year. Bye-bye.